Out of any of the ancient civilizations of antiquity, the ancient Greeks probably attributed more innovations, philosophies, and ideologies to our modern world than any other, and in conjunction with the Phoenicians, Romans, Illyrians, Israelites, Egyptians, and Carthaginians, who were really just wayward Phoenicians, the Greeks were one of many ancient civilizations situated around the Mediterranean, but the Greeks seem to be split on the border between East and West in many aspects, as although Greece is considered to be the spark that created the Western world, they have many attributes and affinities that can be traced outside of Europe. Greeks have had extensive contact with literally every people of the Middle East and North Africa, from the Arabs to the Persians or Armenians. The Greeks were well known to these ancient peoples, and hence much of their attire, cuisine, and many words in their vocabulary are similar to that in the Near East. Similar to how the Chadic peoples of West Africa are mostly dominated by the Western Eurasian haplogroup R1b, quite rare outside of Western Europe, the Greeks are noteworthy for mostly belonging not to haplogroups R and I like most Europeans, but rather the Middle Eastern J and even more remarkably E3b, having one of the highest frequencies of this haplogroup for any ethnic group outside of the continent of Africa where it originated. And it would seem that many people are confused over the position of the Greeks with some of the first search suggestions in Google being are Greeks European, Middle Eastern, Slav, or White. There are many phases of Greek history that have greatly impacted the genetics of the modern Greek nation and led to the many subgroups of Greeks that we see today that are scattered throughout a wide area. The Greeks are fairly unique among ancient peoples, perhaps with the exception of the Phoenicians, as being great colonizers, seafarers, and settlers of the entire known world, having established settlements around the entire Mediterranean, although the Greek nation was anything but united. But indeed, the Greeks have spread their genetics, culture, architecture, and identity farther than they could have ever imagined. 2,500 years ago, Greek cities existed as far as modern-day France, Spain, Libya, Egypt, and especially the Black Sea region. And in fact, in ancient times, it's been found that a large proportion of the upper class in Lower Egypt was of Greek origin, and many cities in the country still have a Greek origin and name. And speaking of which, although it is certain that Greek belongs to the Indo-European language family, linguists are unsure whether its lexicon is clustered with the Indo-Iranian or European substratums, although most can agree that Albanian and Armenian are probably the closest living languages to Greek today, although the Indo-European Anatolian languages were most likely even closer before they went extinct. Nevertheless, Greek is still easily distinguished from literally every other language in the world by its unique and ancient script based on ancient Phoenician, and although there were many mutually unintelligible dialects of Greek in the past, only a few outside of standard Greek still exist today. More on that later. Now, being on the very fringe of the European continent, the Greeks were centered around the Aegean Sea, with Greek city-states on either side, such as Sparta, Athens or Corinth on the European side, and Troy, Ephesus or Smyrna on the Asian side, and ancient records show that although highly divided, the Greeks still considered themselves as belonging to a single nation, with all other non-Greek people being barbarians. As mentioned earlier, although the Greeks had established many informal colonies throughout the Mediterranean, with Greek cities and architecture found in Jordan, Syria, and Egypt dating back since 2000 BC, it wasn't until the rise of Alexander the Great that the Greeks established themselves as a conquering people, and it does seem quite interesting that Greek conquests almost always were directed towards the east, into the Middle and Near East, and even further away from the European continent. After centuries of wars with the Persian Empire, at the age of 21, Alexander of Macedon, considered to be one of the greatest military geniuses in all of history, united many of the Greek, also known as Hellenic nations, in an invasion of the Achaemenid Empire, starting in Anatolia, also known as Asia Minor in antiquity. Alexander swiftly defeated the Anatolians, Persians, and their Greek allies, proceeding on a complete and total conquest of the most powerful empire in the world at the time, and when offered rule over Anatolia in exchange for peace, Alexander wrote to Darius III of Persia, summing up his motives pretty well. Your ancestors came to Macedonia and the rest of Hellas, and did us great harm, though we had done them no prior injury. I have been appointed leader of the Greeks, and wanting to punish the Persians, I have come to Asia, which I took from you. 
Greek cities were soon established by settlers and soldiers from Greece throughout all of the former Persian Empire, with nearly two dozen being named after Alexander himself, with perhaps Alexandria and Egypt being the most famous of which still exists. However, following his death, very shortly after his complete conquest of the Persians, the Macedonian Empire was in catastrophe, as with no clear successor, the empire quickly descended into complete devolution, with much of Alexander's family, generals, and other Greeks divided up the land. Many of these post-Macedonian Greek kingdoms such as the Indo-Greek or Greco-Bactrian kingdoms lasted for centuries in the east as I've discussed in past videos with Greek rulers in South Central Asia surviving even after Macedonia itself was conquered by the Romans with Egypt being the last remnant of Alexander's empire to be absorbed by Rome as Cleopatra, the last pharaoh of Egypt, was of Greek origin through Ptolemy I, a Greek general in Alexander's army who had established a dynasty dynasty in Egypt some 250 years earlier. As many know, Greek was essentially the second language of the Roman Empire after Latin, as descendants of Greek settlers and assimilated natives of Anatolia, the Levant, and Egypt were dominant in the eastern Mediterranean, and hence once Christianity began to spread from the east, Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek became the main vehicles for transportation of the religion, which is why some of the earliest Bibles are written in Greek. Once the Roman Empire split its eastern half, the Byzantines can sort of be thought as a Neo-Greek Empire, as Greeks were clearly dominant in the majority of Anatolia, as well as much of the Levant and Egypt had effectively been Hellenized, although the Syriac and Coptic Egyptian populations did remain in the majority. After the Islamic invasion and conquest of the Near East in the 7th century AD, following the Byzantine-Sassanid Wars, the Greek presence in the Middle East and Eastern Europe was greatly diminished, and many of the Greek-speaking Orthodox Christians in the Levant were converted to Islam and assimilated into the new Arab majority, while others still retained their Christian heritage, although lost the Greek language over the centuries, with most identifying as Arab Christians or Melchites, and there are large populations today of Greek Catholics. Catholic or Greek Orthodox Arabic speakers in Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan. Another huge blow to the Greeks of Asia was, of course, the rise of the Seljuks and Ottomans of Anatolia, and although ethnic Greeks were the majority in Anatolia for much of its history, they were gradually pushed out of the peninsula, and eventually, by the time of Greek independence from the Ottoman Empire in the early 19th century, Greeks were relegated to a minority in large Ottoman cities or the coastal fringes such as the Mediterranean and Black Sea coasts, with the latter group of Greeks being known as the Pontic Greeks. When the Ottoman Empire began to crumble and ethnic and religious divisions were at its height during World War I, many ethnic Greeks still living in Anatolia were seen as enemies of the state and targeted in a systematic genocide along with Armenians and Assyrians, with the population exchange between Turkey and the Balkans lowering their numbers even further, as the vast majority of Christian Greeks in Bulgaria, Romania, and Turkey fled or were forced to resettle in Greece, despite living in such regions since antiquity, and many Islamic Turks were deported to Turkey in kind. This is part of the reason for the extremely high regional variation in both culture and genetics within the Greek population, which reflects a history of both sporadic external migration as well as isolated endogamous lineages. However, despite all this, in terms of autosomal or overall ancestry, ethnic Greeks native to the Balkans overwhelmingly cluster around other European groups, especially Albanians and other Southern Europeans like Romanians, Italians, and Maltese. However, the ethnic Greek identity is quite complex and includes far more than simply those born in the country of Greece. The reason Greeks share such a large genetic and cultural similarity with Italians, especially those in the south, is due to the very old ties of Greek colonization and influence in the region, despite sharing no land border, and in fact a small, very old community of less than 100,000 Greeks known as Grecos or Grecanici in Italian still exist in Calabria, Apulia, and Sicily in the far south of Italy. There are also much smaller Greek communities still scattered throughout the Black Sea region, such as in Ukraine or Georgia and Armenia and the Caucasus, although ever since the fall of the Soviet Union, the vast majority of these ancient and once vibrant communities have left for Greece, Western Europe, or the United States. Because many Greeks converted to Islam in Anatolia over the centuries of Ottoman rule and were assimilated into the Muslim population, a large part of the Turkish gene pools of Greek origin, and although the same can be said 
in the reverse to an extent, with there being small numbers of Turkish converts to Greek Orthodoxy and being assimilated into the Greek population. By and large, the Greek gene pool in the Balkans has remained static since antiquity. On the island of Cyprus in the eastern Mediterranean, Greek and Turkish Cypriots are far closer, genetically speaking, than Greeks and Turks are from the mainland, as at one point they were essentially the same people, and even more so than the Greeks on the mainland, the genetics of Cypriots are tied to both the Levant, Egypt, and pre-Turkic Anatolians, as can be judged by their haplogroup makeup being split between European and Middle Eastern subclades, although most Greek Cypriots still express predominantly European features. Although the Greek presence in the Middle East, North Africa, and the Black Sea region, historically the heartland of the Hellenistic realm, is virtually drying up altogether, there are still cultural, architectural, and linguistic influences seen throughout the region and the entire world that we owe to the ancient Greeks, as well as there being a large diaspora Greek population in the Americas, Australia, and even Sub-Saharan Africa. And should the Greek Orthodox or Greek Catholic Arabic speakers of the Levant be considered the last remnant of Greek rule in the region? Well, there is no straight answer, but I'll leave it up to you guys to answer. As for today's poll, let me know just who should be included as a part of the Greek nation. And be sure to let me know your thoughts on the unique and vital history and genetics of the Greek people. And as always, thank you so much for watching. This has been Mason, and I'll see you next time.